Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Richard Brain, UKIP leader, and uh, I am delighted to be able to talk to you uh, live uh, through an internet broadcast, and I've got lots of great questions coming in. So uh, I will read out uh, questions and, and the questioner as well. And um, I hope that I'm able to uh, answer your questions. Please, if you have a question that occurs to you during the show, please send it in. Uh, who are we sending, Johnny, who are we sending questions to? So the questions, I'll just write in the chat. Uh, just write it into the chat, okay, and it will be, it will be told to me and I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to them. I've been trying to look through some of these questions uh, and we'll see uh, where we get to. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to start at the beginning. And uh, okay, there's an, okay, the first question is from Alan, um, a great uh, UKIP activist. And uh, Alan's asking about the forum. And the answer is, I'm afraid to say that uh, over these weeks, uh, I've made very little progress with that. But I do have a software conference coming up uh, next weekend, not this weekend. Uh, we're going to meet uh, several UKIP members who are uh, involved in software development, are going to meet uh, probably in the Midlands somewhere, maybe Birmingham, uh, next weekend, not this weekend. And we're going to spend a whole day together. Uh, and we're going to be getting this uh, project well underway. At the moment, the canvassing software is actually operational, and shortly I will be uh, deploying it in a local election in Gravesend or uh, Gravesham in uh, in down in Essex uh, for a fantastic member, Ryan Ryan Waters, uh, who I've worked with before, and um, so the canvassing software is actually going to be uh, in action very shortly uh, in the, in the next uh, day or two. Um, <clears throat> the forum software, the main thing is, of course, we need to have uh, forums. WhatsApp groups are proving to be difficult uh, because moderation isn't good there, and it's very difficult to get through the volume of material on WhatsApp. Uh, there isn't really any quality filter, so you can't go in um, like the old days and, um, and choose just to read the comments that are highly rated by your peers. And that's a great way of uh, going through a forum quickly and efficiently. So that's what we will have, uh, and it will come. Please be patient with me. To some extent, my efforts in this regard have been held up by various uh, other uh, things I've had to deal with over the last few weeks. Um, I've got a, a message here from David Hull. Uh, I was elected with uh, far more votes than any other candidate. When are people in the party going to pack it in uh, and stop, uh, uh, pack it in, try to stop me carrying out my rightful duties? Uh, David, I'm right with you. I really, really look forward to that. Uh, moment. Um, obviously, it's been quite difficult for me. Uh, a lot of the things that I wanted to do when I was elected uh, haven't been possible. Uh, the NEC does have the right under our constitution to, to hold a leader to account, to have, uh, I think, what they call in the US um, oversight uh, and look at what I'm doing and make sure it makes sense. And sometimes I think it can take time for people to uh, come around to certain ideas. I'm sure that I could have presented um, some of my plans and ideas better. Um, you know, that's normal. I'm, I've come into a new role uh, that I've never done before. Not many people uh, have, have actually had to lead a political party uh, unexpectedly. So, so um, watch this space. I'm sure that we're going to make progress. Uh, the NEC do their job uh, and um, any, any difficulties that we have there, we're going to work them out. It's a matter of time. Uh, I know that from visiting lots of branches that the members are supportive of me and want me to be able to get through the things that I want to do. And so uh, I hope that uh, as long as I I'm continue to be determined, uh, we'll get there. So please be patient, David. Uh, it'll happen and things will get better. Uh, we've got a message here from Mark in Brum. Uh, I can't do a Brum accent. I love a Brummy accent, a duck. but. Uh, or is that Stoke? But, but, uh, but this is the question. With the prorogation being overturned, do you think Brexit will still happen on the 31st? Uh, and if so, what kind of Brexit? Well, this is the question that everybody, not just in this country, but frankly, in the most of the, most of the Western world are asking, is, uh, is the EU ever going to allow Britain to um, escape its uh, suffocating clutches? Um, and this week, we've had this extraordinary decision by a Supreme Court uh, to insert itself above our Queen and our Parliament uh, and government, uh, and obviously, to some extent, still um, right now, subordinate to uh, the European Union. 
uh, because uh, that's the setup that we have. So, you know, if you want to look at the real, at the real hierarchy of power, uh, EU, British Supreme Court, somewhere below there, the Queen and, and, and government. Well, that's a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. Um, and uh, it's very, very unusual for a court to interfere in the workings of Parliament. In the, um, I think it's the 1589 Act, uh, the, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but it some, says something, that, something about um, a, the proceedings of Parliament should never be interfered with by courts. In other words, Parliament used to be regarded as the highest court in the land. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this Supreme Court has usurped it. Uh, it was introduced by Tony Blair back in um, I think 2004. Uh, many other countries, it was 2008, but anyway, many other countries in Europe, including I think Denmark and, and Finland and various other countries, uh, were also made to introduce a Supreme Court uh, under this uh, strange um, idea of the separation of powers. Um, essentially, what I think what the EU was really doing by requiring countries to, 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 to introduce these courts is uh, separate the national powers from the national governments. Essentially, uh, uh, these courts are uh, the talons of the European Union and they concentrate power in the European Union and make the national government subordinate ultimately. Um, and they're a way of disenfranchising the elected uh, powers of the nation, democratic nations of Europe. So a very negative step. Uh, and I think, I hope that um, very soon we're going to publish a manifesto that says that UKIP supports abolishing the Supreme Court. We used to have a system that worked for hundreds of years extremely well, uh, where you had the law lords, I think 130 plus years of the law lords, where um, a subset of the House of Lords was the ultimate court of the land. And before that, the House of Lords itself was the ultimate court of the land. Uh, so. Obviously, we need to look at the House of Lords. As you know, we've got uh, a policy to look carefully at the House of Lords and decide um, wh whether there's an argument for replacing it uh, with something better. But um, certainly at the moment, the House of Lords is just a huge um, orgy of cronies who have been put in place by um, various, obviously, Labour and uh, Liberal Dem and Tory governments. Uh, and they're just they're just cronies to the exit to the um, to, to the, the House of Commons and the, and the parties in the House of Commons, uh, and they've shown themselves to be, as far as I can see, uh, disinterested in the people in the, the actual people's vote that we had in 2016 when the people of this country voted to leave, and the House of Lords has been extremely helpful to the Commons in blocking that. So um, you know the power should come back to the House of Lords. The House of Lords needs to be reformed. I think that's what that boils down to. Uh, coming back to this, this question, that's only one aspect of it, of course. Um, are we going to see um, Brexit actually delivered on the 31st? Who knows? I don't know. I would love to see it delivered. I would love to see what I call Y2K2 uh, happen, where we roll over. There is a um, actually leaving the EU, which has been renamed uh, No Deal in order to make it sound more negative. Uh, so if we actually leave, then uh, I think we'll, we'll see life very much carry on as usual for the great majority of people. Most businesses uh, who are run by anybody with half a brain cell in this country have made arrangements to ensure that uh, they don't have problems when we leave. There is a whole world out there of suppliers of everything, uh, and so sensible businesses have already, they're already ready for Brexit. Uh, government is prepared. We've got hundreds of separate arrangements that we've made for what happens when we, um, when we actually leave without a deal. And my view is that if we do leave without a deal, we will very soon after that have people knocking on the door of Downing Street uh, coming to ask for deals because we're the fifth biggest economy in the world and we're, we're the European Union's biggest customer uh, and they are going to want to keep doing business with us. Uh, so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, I think we will, we, we will be in a strong position. I've always thought that we would be in a stronger position to negotiate good deals with EU countries trade-wise uh, once we've actually left. Uh, because until we leave, the EU and EU countries are always going to hold back in the hope that somehow they can save it and they can keep their, one of their biggest donors as well as one of their biggest trading partners on board and under the control of the EU anti-democratic government. Uh, so what's, that's it, what kind of Brexit? 
We know that they're looking again at the withdrawal agreement uh, and there's a real danger that some of the appalling things in, in that um, surrender instrument will be resuscitated. I was very, very pleased today to see Boris Johnson referring to that agreement as a surrender document, I think was the term he used. And surrender instrument was the term used for what the Japanese signed at the end of the Second World War. Um, but yes, a surrender instrument, certainly it, it is. And uh, so, yeah, so I hope we don't have some terrible deal signed and, and passed by our commons in extremis and under duress because they're all so fearful and they all believe in, in this, uh, you know, th this great doom and gloom story that has been painted uh, about this country uh, for the last three, or, well, the last 30 or 40 years. The reality is that before we joined the EEC, EC, EU, we had higher per capita growth, 2.9% on average. And after we joined, we had lower per capita growth 1.7% on average. And there's no evidence of any serious economic advantage of being in the bloc. There's some evidence to say that we, to some extent, have been asset stripped as a country and that we have suffered economically uh, uh, through our membership. And that's why I think there's a lot to look forward to uh, when we do leave. So I'm, I've got my fingers crossed for a real proper Brexit. That, that They call it no deal. It's not no deal. We'll have hundreds of deals. Um, that's what I'm praying for. Will it happen? With this parliament, I don't know. Uh, I think that we need to replace our parliament and sweep out all of the, the feeble, cowardly traitors in there and put in people that believe in this country, real British patriots like you and me, who believe that Britain, with its great history and its extraordinary links with countries all over the world, can, can actually participate in the big global market. 85% of the world's market is outside the EU and it's growing and that's the part that we want to be in because that's where we'll do better. Uh, I hope that's an answer to that question. Um, in terms of, uh, I should just mention quickly, I don't know what relevance this has to um, the issue of whether we really leave but uh, on the 31st, but I do know that my local Tories are out canvassing and pointing out a general election in November. So that's an interesting, uh, if they know something that, uh, that uh, I don't or that we don't, uh, that could be an indicator that we are facing an election very soon. Um, so what have we got? Number four, the Dicky Doodah. Uh, I don't know who the Dicky Doodah is, but it's a great name, love it. Uh, uh, from one dick brain to one Dicky Doodah. Uh, which has made your start as leader more difficult, the obstructive NEC or the imposition of integrity? Um, mm, that's a very, uh, that's an awkward question. I, I don't see the, the two things as being separate. I, I do think that the two sides of, an, of, a, of the argument sort of flinging mud at each other uh, has brought out the worst actually in both sides. Uh, I see myself as being moderate, somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, I'm not prepared to, uh, to you know, uh, ostracize members who last summer and recently and generally are supporters of the good things that uh, Tommy Robinson has done. I'm not, I'm not equally uh, prepared to go along with those who think he should join the party because I think that we'll be labeled the Tory Robinson party forever and it will always limit our electoral appeal and it will stop us ultimately solving the very problems that we all and, and Tommy would like to see solved. So, so it's not the answer, it's not good for the party, it won't be good for him and it won't solve the problems uh, that we're talking about in terms of uh, asymmetric policing and the orders that were given, as, as I understand, by Labour uh, to uh, police forces all across the country to turn a blind eye to particular kinds of crime uh, because the perpetrators were generally from a particular um, protected group. Uh, I hope that answers that question. I want the fighting to stop. That means um, if you're a moderate person like me and you agree with what I've just said, that, uh, that we shouldn't relax our, our rules about uh, who can enter, who can join the party. Uh, uh, but if you also don't think that people should be uh, persecuted or ostracized for having su supported Tommy, then, um, then stand for the NEC. You've still got um, about, uh, I don't know, 16, 20 hours to put in your application for the NEC, uh, but stand for the NEC, get on the NEC, 
We need to restore Gerard Batten to where he should be, at least, at least a member in good standing in this party. He's contributed so much over the years, and it really is disgraceful that he is not uh, even a member in good standing after all that he's done for the party, including rescuing it last year. Uh, and including 15 years as an MEP. He was a founding member. He's been involved in the party for 27 years. Uh, you know, so Gerard deserves our respect. He's experienced, he's intelligent, he's got a, he's got a spine of steel. Uh, and for me, uh, knowing that he's there and available to give advice and opinions is, is really is vital. Uh, so he shouldn't be treated the way he is. And I hope very soon that uh, the NEC will, uh, will actually admit that he is in good standing. My belief is that the uh, Constitution was misapplied when he was stopped, uh, when I was stopped from making him my deputy, because the uh, 4.12 says, uh, at any given time you're, in, you're not in good standing, or you are in good standing if X, Y, and Z, at any given time. And at this given time, Gerard, as far as I can tell from those rules, is in good standing. He's not currently blocked from any election. Uh, and that was the rule that they used to say he wasn't in good standing. So I think Joe's in good standing, uh, and I want the NEC to admit it, uh, and in, instead of treating him like a leper, to treat him as the great statesman of the party that he is. Um, <clears throat> let's come on to, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that, that's dealing with that side of things, in, uh, the NEC, but also, please don't support integrity. Integrity is a contributor to this conflict. It may be inadvertent, and people who join Integrity may have their heart in the right place and, and very sound principles, uh, but, but it is a contributor to the conflict because it's stirring up the very thing that I wanted to put behind us when I was elected, when I was standing for election as leader. I wanted to put uh, that issue behind us and say, forget it, this is our plan, this is how we're going to move ahead. And I'm afraid to say that you know one of the uh, Integrity rules um, has uh, items, item 11, uh, actually it disagrees with me. It's undermining my leadership and the plan that I have for the party. Uh, and it's incredibly helpful. So uh, un it's incredibly unhelpful. So please don't support integrity. The other problem is that it looks like the NEC may be plotting some kind of purge of integrity members, which I totally disapprove of. But unfortunately, as leader, I don't have a lot of power to control NEC decisions. They don't seem to listen uh, excessively to me. Uh, and uh, so I've made it quite clear that I uh, am horrified by the idea of a purge of members uh, in that sort of way. But uh, it may be that the NEC decides to go and have a purge anyway. If it does, I'm sure we'll see uh, a, a lot more people leave the party. The NEC doesn't seem to care about that. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell from the treatment of Gerard Batten, because Gerard's popular, and I think that many members have got very, very annoyed about uh, the way he's been treated. Let's move on to the next thing. Uh, uh, Timmy, Timmy Bobinson, good name, Timmy Bobinson. Uh, where can members get advice on strategic voting in the event of a general election? Well, uh, mm, I don't think we're going to give you any. I tell you why we're going to stand where we should stand, and we're going to we're not going to stand candidates where we shouldn't stand. So if you have a uh, UKIP candidate in your constituency, lucky you, you know where to put your you put your cross on the ballot paper. If you don't, it is up to you. You have to decide which party you think is most likely to deliver Brexit. Now remember in 2017 that many people thought that Theresa May would actually uh, deliver Brexit, uh, and they were conned. And I thought they were being conned at the time, and, and I was right. The party of Heath uh, is, I'm afraid, still the party of Heath, and that's why Boris Johnson's having such a tough time. It may be that he's serious about it and he actually delivers it, but I think it's quite possible that we'll see fake Tory Brexit too. We've seen fake Tory Brexit one under Theresa May. Uh, I worry that we'll see fake Tory Brexit two under Boris, uh, and so that should determine what your attitude is there. I would say, obviously, don't vote for Labour, don't vote for the Lib Dems. You're a UKIPper, you know that uh, those parties are just poison to this country. And, um, you know, I absolutely pray that they do not succeed in an election because they will do untold further damage to this great country, its constitution, and its people. Uh, I hope that's a fairly clear answer. 
I've got here, now we've got uh, Deirdre Trotman. Um, what is your understanding of integrity? What do you want them to do or not do? Well, um, as I understand it today, uh, the founders of integrity have actually erased their uh, item 11, uh, which was the one where, which said that they wanted uh, Tommy Robinson to jo join the party. So I think they have dropped that. And uh, now that they've dropped that, uh, I think most of the aims of integrity uh, seem to me to be very, very sound uh, generally, and essentially mostly already UKIP policy. So I question the need for integrity because really what we need to do is get behind UKIP, its manifesto, its policies, its great history of standing up for the underdog, of making the impossible happen uh, and making sure that we stuck to our principles and our political goals, uh, no matter how narrow the odds of actually achieving them, UKIP has kept going. We kept trudging through the rain and uh, ultimately achieved that uh, extraordinary and glorious referendum result. We have a lot to be proud of in this party uh, and we're gonna have more to be proud of in the future. So I would say, don't worry about integrity, Give your money and your effort and your time and your loyalty to UKIP the party because UKIP has achieved so much and it's got more to do with your help. Uh, let's move on. Seven, Freedom Vigilant. Uh, hello. So, will Mr. Brain ensure the NEC do not embark on a purge of members? Well, I've already spoken of that. Uh, the question of ensure it, uh, I'm not sure I have that power. I will do everything I can to, to make sure that doesn't happen. I, I think it's a, a disgrace. And to be honest, uh, a motion was passed by the NEC this week that amounts to a, a purge. Uh, it said that um, anybody either associated with or supporting integrity should be suspended or expelled from the party. Um, and I think that is, that is absurd and it's gone way too far. I'm very pleased that Integrity have dropped their uh, item 11 now and I hope that that will put the matter behind us and I hope that the NEC will now understand that there's probably nothing uh, that they could do that would be more unpopular with the members than, than carrying out some extraordinary witch hunt. Um, I mean, if you, the person who put forward that uh, motion to the NEC, um, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to be careful what I say here, but uh, his record is not exemplary, if I can put it that way. And uh, all I can say is for someone like that to be trying to have a purge of members just because they disagree with me and with, uh, and with other members of the party in the NEC it, it is obscene. Uh, that's all I've got to say about that and I will do everything I can to stop it. Uh, let's see, now we've got eight. Lachlan Fleming, hello Lachlan. Um, uh, good, a good uh, old Celtic name, I like that. A Scottish name perhaps. Uh, from Oz, oh it's from Australia. Uh, great, how can I be more politically active? General advice. Well, um, about, uh, well, four years ago, my wife said to me, why don't you stop shouting at the radio and go and do something? Uh, and I realized that I had spent too many years of my life shouting at a radio, uh, although I'd always, always voted for what, I, for what I believed in. So I, I did some work for the referendum party in the 90s, and then I started voting for UKIP uh, when the referendum party disappeared. Um, but I'd never really got off my butt and gone out there and, you know, leafleted, uh, canvassed, uh, and made a real effort. But the first time I did that, so I, I started to get involved in uh, autumn of 2015 and the referendum was upon us almost immediately and I went to um, a meeting first of all I went to a UKIP meeting of my local branch uh, big shout to uh, Jack Boville and all of the West London branch the West London massive uh, uh, great people whom I love uh, and I met so many good friends and really you know people that I'm proud proud to to be associated with and work with in the West London branch and um, we I then went to a meeting for Grassroots Out uh, above a Chinese restaurant in Leicester Square in, I think, January or February 2016. And this was only a few months before the referendum. And there was a room with about 100 seats and only four of us turned up and a very young man uh, explained to us how we were gonna win the referendum. And I looked around this room at the four of us there uh, and uh, I, I really thought it, it looked absolutely hopeless. Uh, and that's how I became a borough manager for Grassroots Out and then Vote Leave. 
uh, and I've and I've really campaigned hard with a fantastic set of volunteers who I'm I still see, uh, and I was I met several of the people that I campaigned with last night, um, and they're not all UKIP, you know, some of them are are Tory and other other things, but but um, but all great Brexiteers, all great patriots, and we campaigned very hard together, and it was absolutely electric, and we won the referendum, you know, the most exciting. Uh, the most exciting thing that could possibly happen. So I had a, a really wonderful introduction to political activism. Um, and so all I can say is get out there, join a group, get to know people that think the same way you do, uh, and get out there and, and canvas and leaflet uh, and you know, learn about the arguments uh, and, and start putting your politics out there and start persuading people. Because you know, if you don't go out and actually talk to people, listen to people, formulate political ideas, and and try to proliferate them, uh, then you know the world would have no politics. You know we need to actually in, be involved in politics in this way for politics to work. So get on and do it. Um, and whatever the whatever the political issues that you feel most strongly about, go and go and do them because what matters is what you is what you feel in here. That's the real core of political activity is what you you know campaigning for what you know to be right what you believe in. Uh, that's what I say to you, Lachlan. Good luck, and I hope you do fantastic things. Uh, nine, I've got a message from Pat. Connor, good to see you. Pat, nice. Uh, uh, always love Pat. Do you regret not going to the conference? Um, the answer there is yes, I do regret it. I wish I, wish I had attended conference. Uh, I wish I could have attended conference. But I do feel that I was pushed into a corner uh, so impossible by the NEC. Um, to give you some perspective on that, uh, uh, on, on several occasions, I, um, or two, actually two occasions in particular at, at NEC meetings, I was very concerned about the numbers going and I thought that we needed to postpone conference. But in fact, what I realized was that one of the reasons, well, the main reason actually why, why people weren't buying tickets is because they were so angry about what's been happening to Gerard and the way he's been treated. And many people boycotted the conference because they're so angry about that. Uh, and it was their way of protesting and, and saying to the NEC, sorry, you're on your own. Uh, we don't agree with the way you're treating him, uh, treating Gerard Batten. Um, and in the end, I felt that I had to be in solidarity with uh, the people who felt the same way and believed the same things I do, that Gerard's being, being ill-treated in, in a very in a very shoddy way, in a very squalid way. Um, and, but, but what I did do is I said to the uh, NEC, look, here are um, things. If you change these, I'll come and I'll speak. And right up till the Saturday morning, I had a meeting with Donald Mackay, a very, very charming and nice uh, uh, NEC member from Scotland, and explained to him, you know, I would walk into the conference and speak if the NEC would simply publicly admit that Gerard is in good standing. Uh, and what answer did I get? Nothing. Nobody called me. Nobody texted me. Nobody said, OK, you know, we've, we can compromise here. And that has been my experience from day one. Essentially, as soon as I came into the leadership, uh, I've, I have found um, it very difficult uh, to deal with the, uh, I would say, um, how can I put this? Uh, I, I would say, a, 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 a more or less obstinate attitude, um, uh, and that's why compromise has been impossible. Uh, and I still say uh, Gerard Batten must be accepted as in good standing by the NEC. Get on and do it. Do not hesitate, because members are leaving this party on account of that, and that alone, in numbers. So fix it. Uh, that is why I was unable to attend. I needed to be a man of my word. I said, do this and I will attend. And, you know, no olive branch was held out and there it was. And um, the reason why I was there in Newport is that there we have some wonderful members who I, who I love dearly and I love the members of this party. And uh, we've got a wonderful member, uh, Charlie, big shout to Charlie, who, who flew from China uh, and I was determined to to, to come and see her, um, you know, even for a short time, because she'd made all that effort to come here to, to the UK. And, um, and so uh, my, I feel very much my duty is to all of the members, 
um, uh, and to uh, represent them and to know them uh, and, to, and to be their be their leader. And that means listening to them, meeting them, fraternising and, and having a good time, talking about politics, making sure that we get the right policies and getting those policies out there. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Pat. Uh, I would have loved to have been there, but I felt that I was pushed into a corner and it it was impossible and the slightest compromise would have got me on that stage but that compromise never came uh, 10 godless barbarian that's that's quite a quite a name godless barbarian let's see what your question's like legalize cannabis in the manifesto question mark I accept uh, I see I note that you you have a question mark behind it um, look personally I'm not in favor of that there was a group in UKIP um, a year ago, a couple of years ago, uh, set up by, I think, uh, Ben Walker and Bill Etheridge called the Indigo Group. Um, and I went to an event that they had at the uh, IEA, Institute for Economic Affairs in Westminster. And there was a speaker at that event who was arguing for the legalization of cannabis. And we had votes. And I think even a majority of uh, Indigo Group members uh, uh, may have, I'm not sure the majority did vote for it actually, but, but it, was, it was probably closer than you think. Um, there is an established connection between psychosis and uh, habitual use of cannabis. Um, in the US, the experience of um, legalizing it has not been altogether positive. Uh, the idea is that legalizing it would displace the black market and make things um, safer and you know, less crime and so on. But in fact, I think uh, the statistics now are suggesting that that doesn't happen. It just means that people buy a lot more and take a lot more cannabis, and both the black market, uh, which is, uh, offers uh, stronger, stronger versions um, of various drugs, uh, and the commercial market continue side by side. Um, and so, the, so there's a real question mark over whether it, 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 um, it actually reduces uh, criminal activity associated with uh, the drug trade, drug industry. Um, and it does people harm. We already have two major drugs that are, you know, recreational drugs that are legal, alcohol and tobacco. Um, of course, and vapes have become big now as well. But, but um, you know, we have those drugs. The question is, do we need more drugs and do we need mind-altering drugs? Um, and I've heard all the arguments that, you know, oh, alcohol's mind-altering too and uh, people are more inclined to violence and alcohol, that sort of stuff. Well, Chris, um, Peter Hitchens would disagree with you. He thinks that cannabis is a contributing factor in a lot of violent crime, including terrorist crime. Uh, and he may actually be right in putting forward that and saying there is some evidence for that. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, the party, I think, has looked at this. By and large, I think UKIPers, I think if you took a poll of the members, my guess would be, and it is just a guess, that uh, UKIP members would be against legalization so uh, I hope that the forum that we, that we produce and get people using will enable people to air these views, discuss it all, uh, and vote on these things, uh, first of all, for fun and indicatively, uh, and perhaps one day in the little bit further into the future, actually really have members voting on what policies UKIP implements. And there may be a day in the future where UKIP members uh, decide that they do want cannabis legalized. Uh, but I think right now, um, we haven't, we're not there yet. So let's move on. Uh, 11, one, two, three. Um, it's not a very romantic name. It says, the NEC don't want Gerard. Why not appoint someone else as deputy? Well, first of all, when it comes to deputy, um, the, in fact, it's not essential to have a deputy. Uh, there's no requirement to have a deputy. The reason why I asked Gerard to be my deputy was I thought that it would be I mean, it sounds amazing now to say this, but I actually thought that it would be a, 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 a sort of consolation gesture, bearing in mind that he had been stopped from standing in the leadership. Uh, I thought that it would be an appropriate way of recognizing him and his contribution and his experience and what he contributes to the party in terms of what he knows about the European Parliament, uh, Brexit, uh, you know, all his, his knowledge and experience is, is, is great. And um, so I thought that it would be a good way of formalizing um, a sort of thank you to him and keeping him on board and making sure that he was involved in, in, in the party. Um, and clearly it hasn't turned out like that. And I didn't realize uh, uh, really how, um, 
I suppose how unforgiving uh, some people are um, about about uh, Gerard's, you know, mistakes. You can't be a, a leader of a party without making mistakes. Uh, everybody does, uh, and with hindsight, it's very easy to look back at the decisions that were made and say, "Oh, you know, you shouldn't have done that." Obviously, but at the time when you have to make those decisions, often, you know, not enough information is available, uh, and you try to guess what you need to do. Uh, and you do your best. And um, I could recommend a, a wonderful film called The Fog of War about, uh, it's really just interviews with Robert McNamara about the mistakes that were made in the Vietnam War. And it's really, really enlightening because The Fog of War is about how difficult it is to make political decisions on the spur of the moment uh, without the knowledge of the future that ends up usually making the decision look wrong. Uh, so I'm, I may be a little bit more forgiving about that. Um, and. So that's the issue of deputy. We don't necessarily have to have one. I would like probably to have a deputy in the near future, but making appointments has proved to be quite tricky. Uh, and so for the moment, uh, I am just seeing what progress we can make. Uh, we've got NEC elections coming. That's very, very important. Uh, and I hope you'll all be voting in, in those elections and voting for uh, the people who are going to uh, make the party work a little bit more harmoniously and a little bit more efficiently and with a little bit more of a vision for how we can progress and move forward and do new and exciting things. Um, so that's the issue. Uh, why not appoint someone else as deputy? Yes, I may well do, uh, and that may happen quite soon. But there are other appointments also that need to be made, very important appointments uh, to do with how the party is really run. Uh, so uh, 12, uh, Hicks Politics. Uh, I think that's Chris. Is that Chris, Johnny? Chris, uh, good to hear from you. Uh, I've loved working with you. You're a fantastic geezer. Uh, and um, I really hope we're going to pick things up and that we'll be working together again soon. Um, and uh, you say, when will you demonstrate your sick skateboard moves? <laughs> uh, I used to skateboard uh, quite a bit in my youth. And I have been on a skateboard in the last couple of years, in a skate park even. I used to go in, up in the... Um, in the sort of half ramp up in uh, Royal Oak, I used to skate up there, um, and uh, I've broken both my feet there. Uh, I don't skate much these days. Uh, I'm getting a bit brittle, uh, and I've got a lot more, a lot of other things on my plate. Perhaps I should take it up again. I do remember, and never ever do this, I have survived my youth, uh, like many people, uh, and I look back and say, these are the things never to do. Um, uh, because I do remember once doing an axle grind on the edge of a tube platform, but don't tell anyone I said that, and nobody should ever, ever do anything that stupid in his life, ever, or her life. Right, where are we going? 13, um, 13. I mean, that was back in the old days before health and safety, and in my case, sanity. Um, 13, uh, and you could argue that uh, that's still in short supply. Uh, Bugle Boy, is there any progress on Gerard Batten? No. Uh, 14, that English gent. The chairman of the Newbury branch has been reaching out. Will he be able to get in touch and visit the branch? Yes, I can't wait to come to Newbury. Uh, I love coming to the branches. I love meeting the members. It's always really good fun. So please invite me to come to your branch. I'm coming to see you. Uh, I can't wait and it's gonna be interesting and fun. And hopefully we'll have a beer uh, and perhaps maybe a little cigarette around the back of the bike shed. Right. 15, James Alexander. Uh, do you plan to make any changes regarding the disastrous government policies of mass immigration and multiculturalism? Any plans for an English cultural revival? Yes, it's in our manifesto. We're pretty clear about that. Our manifesto is very good and the details are in there. We want a, a points-based system that is a lot stricter than where we are. We want to bring immigration levels right down. We need to sustain British culture, British history, British national identity. We need to make sure that this country exists uh, as, as its own independent, unique, wonderful place in the world that other countries look to and admire uh, and are friendly with uh, and respect us and recognize our right to exist as an independent country. So yes, an English cultural revival, well, uh, a British cultural revival, certainly, uh, not just English. We love England, 
but we also love Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and of course Cornwall. I'm sure that Cornish, uh, 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 <laughs> Cornish separatists want to be remembered in that. Um, so, and yes, so mass immigration levels need to come right down. We've got much too much of it. We're not even properly monitoring how many people come in. The Office for National Statistics, I think, has a few people with clipboards from nine to five, a few days of the year at selected airports, asking people, do you intend to stay for more than six months? You know, that, is no, that is no way to um, plan and to properly measure uh, the scale of uh, uh, people entering this country, migration into this country. Um, and in particular, you know, people who come here uh, for, on, on short visas or come here for a short stay and, and, and never leave. And the supermarkets reckon we've got about 80 million in the country. Um, and the government says we've got 66 million. Well, all I can say is we're overcrowded. England is the fourth most densely populated country on earth. It's more densely populated than India. And mass immigration into the UK is madness. There are 3.5 billion people in the world who earn less than two pounds a day. Even if 1% of them could come to this country, talk about 35 million more people in this country, uh, we simply can't sustain it. Our housing, our hospitals, our schools, our transport system, uh, you know, brownfield, greenfield, you name it, we can't actually cope. We've got overcrowding and we need to get this problem under control. UKIP is the party that will do that. Make sure you stick with UKIP. We're the only party that's got the guts to talk honestly about this and talk honestly about the fact that the issue is overcrowding and we need to stop the vast, unprecedented levels of immigration. Right, that's that. Uh, 16, we've got Marie. Marie, hello Marie. Uh, so are you going to produce a UK-wide manifesto to replace the England-only one currently promoted? Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, it's, our manifesto is not England only, but certainly we'll look, uh, when we update the manifesto, we don't, go, we don't start from scratch because our manifesto is so good, has been for years and years. So what we do is we, we make little changes to it uh, and, we, and we polish it up and we make sure that it's, it's really you know, the right manifesto to appeal to people. And uh, if there is not enough recognition of uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland in there, I will have an eye out for that. But one thing I will say is this, UKIP is the de-devolution party. We look back at Tony Blair introducing these uh, extra layers of government in the, inside the United Kingdom, uh, and I think that that was Tony Blair acting for the U European Union to try to break up the, the great historic United Kingdom uh, by giving each region, each, each of the countries of the United Kingdom, uh, a separate parliament uh, in order to actually promote uh, separatism within the UK and that is a great shame uh, we need I think to return to one Parliament the mother of parliaments we need to make sure that Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland feel thoroughly enfranchised by that Parliament uh, that they recognize that that Parliament really represents their interests just as well as it represents English interests um, and you know, I mean, people forget Scotland has actually done very well in Westminster Parliament. You know, we've had a great many uh, uh, parliamentar Scottish parliamentarians in uh, MPs and at uh, higher level in our government. Um, and just think of, you know, I mean, Blair probably isn't Scottish. Brown certainly was a, a Scotsman. Um, and, you know, say Cameron was uh, Scottish. And, uh, you know, you've had uh, all kinds of people like um, Alistair Darling and uh, lots and lots of Scottish MPs at high level in government. Um, same is true, of course, for, for Wales and, and um, you know, Min Campbell and um, DL and all, all these people. So lots, lots of Welsh in as well and um, Northern Ireland. So, so I, I would like to see, and I think it, should, it is consistent with the UKIP's um, political outlook, that we return to um, our parliament representing all of the nations in the United Kingdom properly. Uh, and and uh, interesting point about the Welsh Assembly is, it, the referendum on the Welsh Assembly was 550.3% in favour of it and 49.7% against it. And so it was a very close vote, um, you know, much closer than, than the referendum uh, we, we had in 2016. And nobody made a fuss, oh, well, we must have a, a Welsh Parliament, uh, even though it was that close. 
So uh, I think that the experience of the Welsh under the Welsh Parliament, dominated by Labour as it has been, uh, uh, hopelessly uh, inefficient, uh, terrible ideologically motivated party that has has uh, brought done great damage to the lives of many many people, um, and I think that there are many Welsh people who are absolutely fed up with their terrible Labour representatives in the Welsh Assembly. Um, the other thing is the London Assembly, uh, and uh, we, we may well stand next year on, um, on a manifesto of wanting to abolish the London Assembly. The London Assembly can never really do anything uh, because it has, I think, a 75% threshold for opposition uh, to the mayor. So that's never going to happen because uh, the mayor, in the end, can never be opposed. So it's just a talking shop uh, it doesn't actually provide any kind of proper debate or opposition to to anything. So, um, so the, we've got lots of assemblies now, and the I think the idea of them was to break up the UK. Well, we don't want to break up the UK. We are the United Kingdom Independence Party, uh, and that means we stand for the UK as this wonderful marriage of nations that has gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and being successful. Uh, and not all marriages work. The United Kingdom is one that has worked and been a, a great success in history. Uh, and there are plenty of examples of unions that have failed and been bad news and have been oppressive. Uh, and I think you know where I'm talking about. So that's that. Let's move on. I've got uh, 17 uh, WRFM paradox. Uh, I don't know what WRFM means. Uh, you read the manual, something like that. How can we tackle the NEC? They were the reason I left UKIP. I'm really sorry to hear hear that. Um, I, it, it's it's depressing to hear that, and I'm sorry. Uh, they were the reason I left UKIP. It didn't feel democratic. I miss Gerard, but I'm so pleased that you're here, Richard. You are truly inspiring. Thank you very much, Paradox. Uh, uh, but we'll have tariffs. Joy. But we'll have tariffs. Okay, good. Uh, oh, I think that's a. I think that's a reference to Femi. Uh, my interview with Femi, maybe uh, whenever it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, the uh, Femi didn't seem to understand that uh, the EU would be raising tariffs on British goods uh, exported there, uh, and it would be the EU citizens who would pay uh, those additional tariffs. He didn't seem to realise that. Uh, but. What have we got? So the NEC, I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, I appreciate what you've said. Uh, 18, EGMO Gaming. What are your plans on immigration? I've just talked about that, EGMO. Thank you for your question. But uh, if you rewind about 10 minutes, you'll learn. Uh, 19, Lee Grant. Once we have left the EU, uh, you do, do you think other countries will follow suit afterwards? Yes, I do. Um, the reason for that is that I think that the EU is, is dreadfully mismanaging the economies of Europe. And I think that when we leave, uh, within quite a short period, there's a good chance that we'll have a, a, a really, really exciting economic lease of, new lease of life, um, a boom. I th I've always predicted a Brexit boom. I think it will come. And when it does come, yeah, many countries, and especially you look at Greece and, and Italy and Spain, I mean, look at Greece having to cope with having a currency that's much too hard for it, uh, and it really struggles to export um, because of that. Um, and so, yeah, so I think countries will look at us booming and go, that's a no-brainer. Whether the EU, at, by that stage, will have completed its um, high-speed military uh, transfer rail network uh, and will have built a, a, a world-class super army to, to go to the um, extremities of the empire and put down um, rebellions there, uh, or whether they'll start building Hadrian's walls again, um, I don't know. But, uh, but I think other countries will leave uh, after a while because they will see that we have been successful doing so. And they will see that the agility, the agility and the freedom, uh, economic freedom, uh, the ability to liberalize, um, and the ability to avoid very large numbers of laws which have been put there, often for anti-competitive reasons, um, will, will give us a boost and others will join. I can't say in what order. Um, I'm worried about Germany. I think that uh, the currency situation, having a soft currency relative to its actual e economic value, um, 
has made life a bit too easy for German exports to the rest of or around the EU um, and and elsewhere in fact uh, and I think that they may we already see that they're possibly on the verge of recession now uh, so I'm worried about that I don't want to see anybody uh, you know I don't want to see anybody suffering loss uh, I want to see you know the world fruitful prosperous happy uh, the whole world all the countries of the world so there's no there's no joy in in any of that, uh, I may, if I may say so. Um, where are we now? When, uh, Twenty guinea pig Sith, will you do a guest appearance on Sargon's Dungeons and Dragons series? <laughs> no, no, I don't think I could. And the reason is, oh, well, I, I, I might, but the problem is, you know, I, I'm, uh, be, I'm nervous of being of being exposed as a super boomer uh, in, a, in an environment where I'm totally unable to understand what's going on around me, uh, and I'm being asked questions. I've no idea what the answer uh, uh, the answer is. Uh, so I, I might, but uh, I'd have to probably wear wear special uh, protective clothing and and. Uh, prep up on, on what I need to know to answer questions on. Um, next, we've got, who's this? We've got Lee Grant, that's Lee Grant, guinea pig. William Lasagna, that's a very nice family name, Lasagna. Did your family actually invent Lasagna? Uh, that's a fantastic uh, uh, contribution to the world. You should be very proud of your, your great, great, uh, great, great grandfather, mother, uh, or either. Uh, full thoughts on globalism. Globalism, uh, wow. Globalism has always been a frightening concept. I think always in dystopian literature, in science fiction, the idea of one world government, um, you know, monolithic government, is intrinsically um, fascist. It's intrinsically, uh, you know, a homogenizing force. And, you know, the world should be a cornucopia, a kaleidoscope. Uh, you know, I, my vision of the world is a patchwork of nations, like, like a network, like the internet. Everybody, all the nations standing on their own feet, all being different in different ways. Of course, there will be domination um, of, of, by one nation of another. Um, but but uh, yes, a network of individuals, uh, we know that that is a model that works in fantastic ways in human civilization and culture. Um, and it is possible to have really successful networks where individuals take responsibility for themselves, they communicate, they trade, and they form a part of what you might call a society. So, uh, so I would rather see the world a, a, a society of nations. Uh, the danger of globalism is the ever-increasing concentration of power in the hands of a tiny few uh, oligarchs. We see that in monopolization, in the monopolization of, for instance, social media um, and the people who run the social media, the famous social media uh, uh, conglomerates, now they are uh, totally globalist. And we see that they have untold power. And this, is, this puts them into, um, you know, into a little, I suppose, a little clique with people in, who have untold power because they're in government. And these powerful people get together and, and they start to conspire um, new ways of increasing their, um, their power uh, and making sure that they never lose it and increasing their own wealth and their own, um, you know, supremacy. Um, and globalism is, is sort of supremacist in that way. Uh, and that's why I reject it. Um, uh, so that's that's what I would that's what I would say. I mean, there's so much. It's, it's such a huge subject, globalism. I mean, I, I obviously reminded of the quote by Marine Le Pen, which she said, "There is no left and right anymore. There are just uh, globalists and patriots." I am definitely a patriot. I think that you have to run your own country. Um, uh, that is the tried and tested formula for organization. Um, big empires usually, in the end, come come to you know come to misfortune one way or another uh, as as history goes on but often big empires are sustained by oppression and by um, you know stamping out uh, alternative uh, views opinions cultures um, races nations whatever it is so uh, and then of course there's the issue of, the, of David Goodhart's book the, the somewhere people and the anywhere people 
that empires, um, by their scale, uh, are anathema to, to the local, the village, the idea of belonging to one tiny little place. And I am definitely a somewhere person. I was born in this house. Uh, uh, There's a good chance I'll die in this house. This is where I'm from. I've got nowhere else to go. This is home. Uh, so I'm a somewhere person. Um, let's see now. Let's move on to the next question. Let's see. Uh, how do you propose we win back uh, the Brexit party voters after Brexit before they join the Conservatives or rejoin Labour? Well, I think the interesting thing is uh, on this question that I, I, my guess is that many of those people who, uh, who are supportive of the Brexit party, and don't forget they can't be members, um, they can't vote for a leader like we uh, just have. Um, and, you know, I voted for, for the leader this time. Uh, it's, it's one of the great things about standing for election is that you can put a cross in the box by your own name. And for once, it doesn't mean that you're going to get sent huge amounts of spam. Uh, uh, it actually means that, you, you know, possibly you're even going to get some, some kind of, uh, approval of uh, approval of some kind. Uh, the, the, so the point there is, uh, what have we got? You know, immigration is the, is the main thing, I think. But also uh, freedom of thought, uh, the true conservatism with a small c rather than the brand that we see uh, foisted on us by the Conservative Party. They're not a Conservative Party really anymore. Um, and I think it, Boris Johnson clearly, I think, is, is pro-big uh, immigration. One of the reasons for that is that the Tories are funded by, um, by big business. And uh, big businesses want wages low. And that's the thing they care about most of all. And they're prepared to have an untold amount of immigration just to keep uh, wages low. And they don't really care if people are living six or seven to a room. Uh, as long as the wages are low and they're doing business and they're making profit, there it is. And that is the Tory way. Uh, I think that's the great weakness of the Tory party and its funding model. And um, so, so we're different from that. Uh, UKIP is a party of independent thinking, free thinking individuals, uh, small business people, uh, we're not funded in that way. We have to fund ourselves through membership uh, and through seeking donations. Uh, we're not like the Labour Party funded by uh, unions. And so as a consequence, I think we are a more individualist party, a more truly conservative party with a small c in the sense of wanting to preserve what's great about our country and our society and our history and our culture. Uh, so that's why I hope people uh, will come back to UKIP and recognize that UKIP has fought for 27 years for Brexit, very hard indeed. And uh, Nigel Farage was put where he is by the work of tens of thousands of loyal UKIPers, probably hundreds of thousands over the years, of loyal UKIPers going out in the rain on a February evening and leafleting and talking to people and trying to persuade people, yes, we really can leave the EU, and yes, it will be wonderful. So, um, so all I can say to Brexit Party uh, supporters, not members, is come back to a party where you can vote uh, for your representatives, you can vote for your leader, uh, and where you can actually be have that kind of stake in, for instance, the selection of candidates for uh, parliament or for local elections, because you can turn up to a hustings at a branch and say, I want, I vote for that guy to be uh, a candidate and, and not him. Uh, so that's it, come back. Uh, we've got a whole raft of policies in our manifesto. Read the manifesto. The Brexit Party has nicked quite a lot of things from the UKIP manifesto. Okay, that's what happens. But it's the UKIP manifesto, and that's where the ideas come from. We are a fantastic ideas party. I, when I meet uh, members of UKIP, they're always talking about politics, about policy, about how you can change the world, about how things ought to be, about the, the structure of things, uh, about so many interesting ideas. Uh, UKIP is a, just an incredible incubator of political ideas. Uh, come back. Where are we? Um, we've got S.J. Bynes. Hello, S.J. Bynes. Question. I finally joined after you were elected. Thank you, S.J. Welcome to the party. Big shout to you. Um, really great that uh, new members are coming in and joining. Really pleased to have you in the party. I want to contribute to the update to the manifesto and also propose new policy ideas. What's the process for this please. So currently the process is that there is a page on the website 
where you can actually put forward policy suggestions. Um, in the long run, and, and by the way, I've got a whole load of them in my bag there, um, and they do, they do come through, um, and they will be read and taken into account when we're updating the manifesto, which could be very soon now. Um, the, ideally, uh, we're going to move to this forum that I have outlined the design of, at least, uh, in the sense of how it will work. The forum will enable people to put forward policy suggestions, and they will be voted on by other members, and so it will be very easy to see each month which policy suggestion put forward by a member has scored the highest uh, approval of other members uh, and, and the least disapproval, uh, and that way other people can help flesh out policies which are suggested, and those policies can rise to the top, and that will be peer review on UKIP policy so that leadership can look at those and say, that's a great idea, we're going to put that one in the manifesto. Uh, it's not here yet, it's coming, I'm going to do it, give me a chance, please be patient. Um, 24, Nox I, Noxy, Noxy. Hi there, Richard. I didn't renew my membership due to the NEC's actions against your appointments. Will there be anything done about the NEC? We've got NEC elections now, and I hope that we're going to get some really good new people on the NEC, and that the NEC uh, hopefully will have a more positive uh, approach. And one thing I would say about letting your membership lapse, uh, for three months after you lapse, you can still renew it, and it's taken that you have continued to be a member. But if it goes for longer than three months, then that will be considered a lapse in your membership, and that will mean that when, let's say you suddenly decide, like I did, you want to stand for something, you want to stand for election, uh, you might want to stand for the NEC, you might want to stand to be leader, whatever it is that you want to do, uh, often the rules about standing are that you have been in the party for a certain length of time. So if you let your membership lapse, then uh, that could mean that you won't be able to stand for a particular role in the next year or two years. Uh, so don't let it lapse. Please renew. Please keep your faith in the party. Uh, things are going to get better. Uh, so that's that. 25, Marty, Marty Morosley. Uh, what's Richard's view of For Britain and AMW? Um, I, I like uh, Amory. I met her several times. Uh, she, obviously, she used to be in UKIP. She came to talk to um, West London and uh, City in Westminster UKIP at uh, at a pub in Pimlico. We had a very interesting time. And uh, many of the things she said, I think, are very, very important. Uh, uh, and I think she's knowledgeable, and she is very genuine and very concerned uh, about some of the things that are happening in this country. Uh, so, so I like her. Um, I would say that after the 2017 leadership election, where she came a very creditable second in the UKIP leadership, um, I. I went to see her at her hotel because I actually wanted to say to her, and did say to her, please stay in UKIP uh, because you've got important contributions to make. Uh, and if you put your shoulder to the yoke, um, you know, you, you, you'll really contribute a lot to this party and please don't go. But she was determined to go and start a new party. Um, and um, I think I realized at that time uh, that, that she, maybe wasn't the best person to, to lead a political party. Um, I think that her political outlook and interests are possibly not broad enough. Um, and I also think that she is one of those very interesting, inspirational personalities, but who can be uh, quite difficult in certain circumstances for people to deal with. It's, I think it's fair for me to say that. Um, and so I, th I, th I realized that I didn't think she was the right person to lead this party, certainly. I didn't th have any idea that I would end up where I am today. Uh, but I have a lot of respect for Amory, and um, I think she's, she's great and she's well worth listening to. Um, uh, that's, my, that's my view about her. Um, also, lots of good people uh, I know who support for Britain. Um, and. Um, you know, good for them, I can understand. They, they feel differently and they want to do that. And sometimes it's hard being a UKIPper. Um, you have to put up with the, the rough, uh, take the rough with the smooth. 
Um, so sometimes it can it can be hard to to stay on board. But but um, uh, I do I do regret the splintering of parties. And UKIP has incubated so many different uh, parties. You know when you think about it, uh, you know there's the Brexit Party came out of UKIP, and For Britain came out of UKIP, and then there was the uh, Donkey Party. I can't remember what it was called now. Uh, I think it still exists. It's called the is it Democrats and Veterans now? Um, John Rees Evans's party. Johnny, do you remember that? Uh, yeah. So and and then um, there are other parties. Look, Henry Bolton's one. Is it called One Nation? Uh, anyway, but you know, you keeps keeps spitting out new parties. Um, and you know, as I've said before, we've got a there's a party doing quite well at the moment that's actually just named after a UKIP policy. It's called the Brexit Party. That's a UKIP policy. It's a whole party named after UKIP policy. So. <laughs> you know, you could argue that the independent group also named themselves after UKIP policy in an effort to try to, um, well, lie and cheat. Uh, I think it would be the right way to describe it because they weren't didn't want independence at all, not for this country. So, but you know, we are the UK Independence Party, and they obviously wanted to uh, have a piece of that action. So, yet another party named after um, UKIP's policies. We've got uh, uh, hate, hated but rated, hated but rated. It's a good name. Mr. Brain was on the buses better than some mothers do have them. <laughs> I, do, I do like some mothers do have them. Yeah. Uh, I can't answer that question. Brilliant, great old, old, old British comedy series. If you haven't watched either of those shows, watch them. You will be entertained. Um, they probably each contain uh, instances, would be my guess, of political incorrectness uh, that may make them... Uh, completely unacceptable today uh, would, would be my guess, but maybe not. Um, let's make uh, let's make that the last. Okay, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, I'll be doing this again regularly, so uh, please, you know, join up again, ask your questions. I hope I've answered them, uh, and uh, I look forward to doing it again soon. Probably going to try to do this every week. Uh, so keep your questions coming. Thanks a lot to everybody. Thanks for fighting for UKIP. I love the Kippers. Thanks for getting out there and campaigning. We're going to do more of it, and we're going to start creeping up the polls, and I'm very excited about that. So keep the faith, and we will get there. Thank you, everyone.